Welcome to Michigan's World War I Centennial News Report for April 2019. Coming Home, the story of the American Expeditionary Force coming home from France back to Michigan. The State Report. On Saturday, August 10, 2019, at Michigan's Military Heritage Museum in Grass Lake, Michigan, a World War I Centennial event will be held. More information and following episodes of Michigan's World War I Centennial News Report. To learn more about Michigan's World War I Centennial or find out about events going on around the state, go to www.cc.org slash Michigan for the latest information on Michigan's World War I Centennial. One century ago, April 1919. On April 3, 1919, Austria expels the Habsburgs with a Habsburg Law. The law legally dethroned the House of Habsburg-Lorraine as rulers of the country which had declared itself a republic on 12 November 1918. It exiled them and confiscated their property. April 6, 1919. Mahatma Gandhi called for a general strike in India to protest the Anarchical and Revolutionary Crimes Act of 1919, properly known as the Rollout Act. The Rollout Act was enacted because of the perceived threat from revolutionary nationalists and it extended emergency measures such as indefinite detention and incarceration without trial. On April 10, 1919, Emiliano Zapata, leader of the peasants and indigenous people during the Mexican Revolution, is ambushed and shot to death in Morales by government forces. April 13, 1919 Under the command of British Colonel Reginald Dyer, British Indian Army troops fire into a crowd of Indians who gathered in front of them, killing 350 people. This became known as the Amasar Massacre. April 23, 1919. Baseball season opens with a reduced schedule of only 140 games versus the year before when they played 154 games in their regular schedule. The reason for this was baseball owners were rattled by low attendance and lack of enthusiasm for baseball in 1918, and they decided to shorten the 1919 season. April 28, 1919. The first jump with the U.S. Army Air Corps ripcord style parachute was completed by Les Irvin. Irvin was a Hollywood stuntman who had been jumping from airplanes since 1914. On November 11, 1918, at 11 a.m., the armistice took effect. Hostilities ceased, but the war was not over. That would come about eight months later with the Treaty of Versailles. The armistice abruptly changed the nature of operations for the American Expeditionary Force in France. The Army would no longer be involved in combat operations, but instead would be involved in construction, cleanup, and training. The Army needed to continue to train to ensure that the German nation would sign the peace treaty at Versailles. The American Expeditionary Force in November of 1918 was divided into three armies. The first two were created for combat, and the newly created Third Army was to become the Army of Occupation, occupying Koblenz, Germany, to ensure that Germany would sign the Treaty of Versailles and also prevent further hostilities. At the end of the war, the German nation was an upheaval. With the Army of Occupation occupying the buffer zone, it would stop the unruly elements of the German population from spreading their 
rebellious ideas into France, Belgium, and Great Britain. The newly created American Third Army would become the Army of Occupation and would march through France to Germany to their home, which would be Koblenz, Germany. They took all their field gear and they were prepared for action, even though none was anticipated and none happened. The Army of Occupation actually found the Germans quite friendly. The rest of the army would be designated to go home. The problem would be shipping. The shipping of the American Expeditionary Force home would become a major operation. It was decided that animals and large equipment and vehicles would be left in France and sold. Units that were designated to be shipped back to the United States needed to get their animals healthy, their vehicles running, and heavy equipment ready for sale. While waiting to be shipped home, units like the 16th Engineers from Detroit worked on the railroads of France, reconnecting them after four years of war. Other units continued to train for combat operations and also were involved in a number of parades or military reviews. The men needed to be ready for combat operations, but also needed to be kept busy. When a unit was designated to return to the United States by orders cut from headquarters, there was a process in which the soldiers went through. First, they were trained or marched to a dirty camp in which they spent several days getting clean uniforms and getting grime off of them. Then they were sent to a clean camp for further purification. While at the dirty camp, this is what one soldier wrote about the mill process. Immediately upon entering the camp, arms were taken into the barracks, and the men, with everything else they had, were marched to the de Lauser, where they were subject to a thorough cleaning that cooties, extra equipment and clothing, German Lugers, helmets, and other souvenirs became property of the outfit operating the mill. Each man, after turning in the equipment, was made to disrobe and hang his clothes on a rack. The rack was shoved into an oven while he colorfully clad in a pair of hobnail shoes, strode nonchalantly down the aisle to the shower room, carrying by its puckering string a little white bag which contained such intimate possessions as franks, handkerchief, cig cigarettes, razors, etc. In the next room, a corps of medical officers successfully looked over his scalp, eyes, nose, throat, chest, etc., etc., daintily tapping his knees with a little rubber hammer. The least sign of a cootie encouraged one of the tormentors to send two men back into the corner with a safety razor. Then came reconditioned of clothing, all sorts and sizes, from all directions until at the other end of the oven was reached. Here he assembled his entire outfit, happy in the belief that the ordeal was over. But he stepped through the door, an officer zipped a comb across his head, and if there was a barber chair vacant, which there always was, he was given a haircut that a student barber would be ashamed of. He paid for it and liked it. The stay at the clean camp could last several weeks while shipping was not available. The men during this time organized sports activities such as football and baseball. First they had intercompany games, then interregiment games, and finally regiment against regiment teams played. Besides physical activity, intellectual activity was also offered. University-level classes were taught in English, French, and Italian. This allowed soldiers to get a chance to try college or those that were in college to continue their studies. For several weeks or months, orders finally came through. Shipping space would be available for the unit to return to the United States. Packs were made up. Goodbyes were said as they marched out of camp to the sound of the camp's ban. The march usually took several hours to march to the port. During this march, the American Red Cross served hot meals to the soldiers. Once at the port, the men would embark on the ship, being assigned sleeping berths. The conditions were usually poor and overcrowded, but the men didn't care because they were finally on their way back to the United States. The voyage across the Atlantic from France to New York usually took about 12 days. As you can see from the photographs, the men enjoyed their voyage home, looking forward to getting home and getting out of the U.S. Army. The first soldiers arriving home got more enthusiastic welcome than the ones who came home later. 
At Camp Upton on Long Island, medical examinations and another delousing took place. Then there was usually about a 10-day wait before the men would finally board trains which would scatter them across the country. Some of these men had been together for almost two years. Even the thoughts of getting home could not remove the feeling of great regret caused by the parting of these old comrades. When the 16th Engineers returned home in May 1919, Mayor Cousins of Detroit wired Colonel Burgess and asking if the 16th Engineers would parade in Detroit upon their arrival. Colonel Burgess's answer was affirmative. On 7 p.m. at the Michigan Central Depot on May 5, 1919, the 16th Engineers arrived home. Platform parties started even before the train stopped, and what a reception the boys received. The Detroit boys went home for the night, and many of them took their soldier pals with them. The next morning, the entire regiment assembled in Roosevelt Park, facing the depot. An American flag was presented by Mrs. R. H. Stromer, who represented the Women's Club of the Service flag, many members of which had been sons, sweethearts, husbands, or relatives of the regiment. The regiment's honorary colonel, William Livingstone, also took part in that presentation. With 660 enlisted men and 27 officers, the regiment marched down Michigan Avenue to Woodward Avenue, to Grand Circus Park, to Washington Boulevard, to Michigan Avenue, and out to the waiting train, which left Detroit at noon, arriving at Camp Custer Battle Creek, 3 p.m. Mustering out proceeded rapidly, and the last man of the 16th Engineers left the Army by Thursday, May 9, 1919. With that discharged veteran's red stripe on his arm, and a little bonus money, expense money tucked away in his OD breeches. Keep them down on the farm After they've 